uh, decent outcome this time. So I'm going to go in and start the live stream. What is up on the Evox, guys? This is Top High Productions 115 coming at you with the first video in quite some time. I had originally planned to do this a little bit earlier in the day, but complications got in the way, and I had to do some network optimization, some network reconfiguration, and um, I will go over that, um, I guess, at a later date. But for now, I'm here to fulfill a promise. A friend of mine recently asked about using ESXi, and I'm just going to walk through some of the basics. Really small stuff, things that most of you can probably get through in five seconds. But I think that these are important factors to really um, get down. First of all, ESXi is, for all intents and purposes, it is a hypervisor. And it is a hypervisor with really awesome features. It is a special made operating system and it is distributed as an ISO image primarily, right? So you download it from VMware. And once you have the ISO image, you then either put it onto a USB or a DVD. You put the USB or DVD, the um, installer boot media, into your server, then from there, power on the server. And when the server boots into the installed media, assuming that you set the boot order correctly, what will happen is it will boot into the installer, and the installer will then ask you what drive do you want to install ESXi on, or it will possibly even ask if you want to have it run from the USB. So then you would pick your install media or possibly have it run from the USB. Once it finishes installing, it will then ask for you to remove the installed media. And then from there it will reboot the server. Once the server reboots, it's then going to boot into ESXi, and when it boots into ESXi, the first thing that you will see is what I'm about to show you here. This will take just a second. Because I have to hop into my integrated lights out 3 to show you this. This and when ESXi powers on, this is or at least something like the window that you will see when you're right in front of the server. It's going to look something like this. So I'm just going to go ahead and hop in with this. Firstly, you'll notice that it'll say VMR ESXi, it'll tell the version, it'll tell what server that it's on, like the branding, make and model, and all that. And in addition to that, it'll also mention processor and RAM. Very basic stuff. And from there, it's going to give you a domain name that you can access it from, a local name of some sort, followed by an IP address, and then IPv6. So initially, when the server powers on, you're going to need this information because that's how you're going to get into the web UI, the ESXi web UI. Now, something else that you probably want to get to is this. During the initial install, ESXi is also going to have you make a password. So when you set the password, it's protecting these settings here. So we're just going to go to Configure Management Network. Under Configure Management Network, you can actually tell it what host name to use, what IP address to put itself on, and IPv6 as well. So once you configure these things, you'll then be able to use either an IP address or a local host name. Now, once you have an IP address, what you would then want to do is simply go into the server. In my case, I've already given it a full domain name, but 
here's what it's going to look like when you first try to log into the web URL. It's going to take you to a login page. This is going to take just a few seconds. There we go. In my case, I don't really have to enter anything. Thanks, keep ass. And um, then from there, we are in. And the first thing I'm going to notice is that I'm using a bone stock vanilla ESXi image. As you can see, there's no branding. If I were using an HP image on my HP Pavilion DL580 G7, you'd see HP branding here, followed by the uh, domain name or host name and all that. And right here, it shows the build and version of ESXi that I'm running. I'm running update three. And it also shows whether or not it's connected to a vCenter. We'll get to vCenter in a moment. But um, it also tells the uptime. In my case, the server's been up for just over one and a half days. In addition to this, it also tells us being managed by vCenter and it gives some information. It gives the model, it gives the processors, RAM, and all that. You've already seen all this. Performance metrics. All of this is on the very front page. This is close. We also have manage, monitor, and other important settings. Um, some of the big settings that a lot of people tend to use. Just going to operate and manage. If you go into manage and then hardware tab and then PCI devices, this is where you configure PCI pass through. So if you have new devices you want to pass to a VM, such as a GPU, a NIC, or anything like that, it's going to show up in this list. As you can see, I've already activated a few. From here, you can also monitor system centers and storage and stuff like that, performance and all that, um, logs, and notifications. Now, most of this um, I don't really have to go into because most of this is kind of in VMware's documentation. But if you're interested in any of this stuff, I would highly suggest going into VMware's documentation to learn more about it. But this is stuff that um, I tend to use occasionally, but a lot of my monitoring is done via a different tool. I'll talk about that tool in a few minutes. But um, the main prize here is the purpose of ESXi, which is to run our virtual machines. And as you can see, I have multiple virtual machines here. And a lot of them are connected to a directory, as you can see. They're all connected to the same domain name. They got those names from somewhere. They got them from an active directory, DNS. So domain controller, um, vCenter appliance. Once again, we'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, a Linux server, a Mac OS instance, and last but not least, a Windows 10 Enterprise instance. As you can see, it shows how much host CPU resource that it's using, and also how much RAM that it appears to be using, at least according to the hypervisor host. Um, if we really actually go into these VMs, they aren't using 16 gigs of RAM because this thing here, Windows Server Data Center, is only given 16 gigs of RAM. And right now it's probably using around 30% of it. That's what it uses when it's idle, usually, even when I'm connected to the VPN. Um, if we look at the Arch Linux VM, that constantly has folding at home running on it, so its memory utilization might be a tad bit higher. Mac OS Mojave, its memory utilization and also disk utilization may be a tad bit higher because it's running a bunch of media servers. Um, and Windows 10 Enterprise, well, it's sitting idle right now, so really, it's not going to be using that much. I remote into most of these. The um the host memory um metrics that you see here, they're kind of hit or miss. Um, I find that it's better to just actually hop into the VM and actually see what's going. On. Um, the use space um this is going to be depending upon not only the data data stores they have attached to the VM, but also dependent upon the raw disks that you pass to the VM. So in this case, you can tell I've passed through quite a bit of storage to some of these VMs, and they're all sitting at around 11 terabytes. I'm going to go on and hop down to here now. Storage. Under storage, we have three tabs, data stores, adapters, and devices. Data stores are, well, they're kind of like logical volumes in a way, I guess. Um, what happens is you take a physical disk, put a data store on it, use that data store to store files and also virtual machines, virtual machine configuration, etc. So in this case, I've created one, two, I've created, I think, six data stores. Five of them are holding VMs. One is being used to hold ISOs and other important files, and that's what I'm using it for. 
as you can see, the DOS are all in really tiny, like 300 to 500 gig disks. The adapters are, of course, the um, post bus adapters and RAID controllers that the disks are attached to. In this case, this SmartArray P410i is the integrated array controller that's built into the server. The LSI is a removable one using NPT2 SAS. That's for all the large drives that you saw. That's part of what got all those VMs to 11 terabytes or so. Um, these other two are ones that are built to the server as well, I believe. However, I'm not quite sure where they're located in the server, but I'm pretty sure those are built into the DL5 g 7 because this ESXi instance is the DL5 g 7 I'm hopping over to devices. We now get to the individual disks themselves. We can sort them by capacity, and we can also see, for example, this is the EMC enclosure. That's where all the big disks are sitting. The four terabyte disks and the eight terabyte disks are all sitting in this enclosure, but it's listed as a separate device. Um, we also have a risk drive, that which I will be using in some of the VMs very soon. Um, I do like movies, that's why I have the Blu-ray disk drive in there. Um, these are all the small disks that the data stores are on. As you can see, these are around 300 gigs. However, the data store only takes up around 280 gigs. Um, if you want to, you can make sure that a data store actually spans the entire disk. Um, that we found in VMware documentation as well. I'll say checked. But that's just the basics on it. Popping over down to the last part, networking. Something that is somewhat important as well. When configuring your network, you actually want to make sure that you have at least one uplink. I mean, this is all done automatically, so you don't, don't even have to worry about it. But in my case, I actually had to make changes to this today in order to actually make sure that my network wasn't complete in order to trash when I was trying to use it. So what you're looking at here is virtual switch zero. In this case, you can see that I've actually configured NIC teaming, a very basic NIC teaming setup, nothing too special. Um, and I have yep, five VMs on a virtual switch. And I have two uplinks, one of which is gigabit and one of which is 10 gigabit. I'm just going to check the status of the stream real fast, and we're still good to go. So, as you can see, this is kind of a basic setup. The most I did was add an extra uplink. That's because of the fact that I kind of want more bandwidth in my local. Um, you don't have to do NIC teaming. It's kind of just a, it's one of those things where you only configure it if you need it. Um, and I'm not really going to give any advice on that today, because in the end, I'm not a networking expert. In my case, I just knew that it might be somewhat beneficial and I decided to actually throw in an extra NIC because I had one sitting around. And it just so happens that the DL580 actually has a 10 gigabit NIC option if you purchase a server with it. So I went on NB. So. But now I'm going to talk about the uh, real meat of the entire situation. Remember the uh, vCenter instance I talked about? Well, here it is. There are two options, Flex and HTML5 can't really use this anymore, the Flex option, because the Flex option is based off Adobe Flash. Adobe Flash has been de deprecated from pretty much the entirety of the internet. We're going to use the HTML5 option instead. It's way better. In addition to this, VMware is supposed to be moving all of the uh, configuration options from Flex over to HTML5, so that anything that you did in Flex is also available in HTML5. As you can see, I'm starting off at not the home page, so I'm just going to jump to the home page. The home page looks like this. As you can see, overall utilization across the entire software defined data center. And I just mentioned a software defined data center. Well, a data center isn't one server, it is multiple servers. So I'm just going to go and pull up another one. And there we go. Yes, XI2 is another server. Now, the beauty of having multiple hosts is that you can team all of those resources together. But it's really tedious to try to actually coordinate these two hosts by hand, right? You have to log into one, log into the other. You have to actually tell one to run one VM and configure and all that. So for example, if I go over here, there's already a VM here because I put it there. But if I wanted to put a whole bunch of VMs on these two different hosts, I'd have to go to one host, log in, go to virtual machines, start adding VMs, go over here, virtual machines again, start adding VMs, Figuring them one by one. However, with vCenter, also known as vSphere Client, I think, 
if you add these two hosts to vSphere, or vCenter, should I say, you can manage them from one panel. Very convenient, right? Now, I'm dumbing it down quite a bit because of the fact that I'm trying to keep this video short, and a lot of the stuff that I'm going to mention is better explained in VMware's own documentation. But, as you can see, overall CPU utilization, overall memory utilization, overall storage utilization, right? All listed in one place. In addition to that, I also have centralized list of objects and associated alerts, plugins, etc. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go on and hop over to... Yes, I'm going to hop over to shortcuts. As you can see, we have a lot of functions that we can access. What I'm going to go over first is Update Manager. Now this is something that I don't think you have access to in ESXi, so one reason to get vSim. Update Manager allows for you to actually set up policies for when and how patches are applied to your ESXi hosts. So, for example, if I go over to, sorry, I think it's settings, right? Yeah, I can tell it when to download patches, when to check for patches, etc. In addition to this, recall notifications. I can also have it check for recall notifications every once in a while as well which means that it's one less task that I have to do by hand. Otherwise, I might have to apply patches by hand to both of these ESXi hosts. Which, mind you, I, I guess it doesn't take too much time, but it's a lot more convenient to be able to do it from here. I'm going to go in and check my chat real fast. And there is no one in chat right now. So, hopping over to the second to last item, hosts and clusters. As you can see in the data center, I'm gonna get a bunch of alarms due to overall resource utilization. In the meantime, then we're just gonna focus on this left side menu. As you can see, ESXi1 and ESXi2 have both been added and their resources are kind of listed in a unified way. So I can tell what my overall CPU utilization is across the data center overall memory utilization across the data center and storage utilization across the data center. Once again, a very nice way to actually match things. I can hop to a single host or I can hop to another host. And I can see storage devices on both of them. In addition to that, I can also start from here and say, hey, why not create a VM? Well, if I say create a VM, guess what's going to happen? It's going to ask for me to Give it a name. So I'm going to give it a name. Yet, uh, yeah. guess what it's going to do next? Here's what it's going to do next. It's going to ask for me to pick a host to put it on. Boom. I can say put it on 10.004. And from there, I can um, pick which data store it's going to be on and etc. As you can see, instead of having to go to ESXi2 10.004 to make that VM, instead I can just make it from here. And in addition to that, I can also configure different policies from vCenter, such as what to do when applying patches, so that I can say maybe I want for all the VMs on 10.002 to move to 10.004 if 10.002 needs to install patches. So let's say that 10.002 needs to install patches, move all the VMs, I guess via vMotion to 10.004, so that 10.002 can actually apply patches and go into maintenance mode, do what it needs to do, while 10.004 makes sure that all the VMs remain up and running for end users to access. And then when 10.002 is ready again, move all the VMs back to 10.002, and then do the same thing for 10.004. Of course, that's a made-up policy. I haven't actually configured that, and I'm pretty sure that there are better policies to configure anyway. But the point is, vCenter is a way of coordinating a software-defined data center. And that is why I actually have vCenter right now. Unfortunately, though, I might not have too much of a use for vCenter soon, seeing that I'm getting ready to kind of decommission this one right here, 10004. But um, we'll talk about the reason why later. The point of today's video was just to go over some basics of ESXi and vCenter and the reason for why I'm using vCenter. 
even though most people using ESXi, I guess, in their home lab might not necessarily have the same. I happen to have multiple hosts. I find it convenient. And on top of that, dark mode is kind of sexy. Now, if I remember correctly, you get dark mode, you go here, switch theme, and that's how you go. I'm not going to go too much into detail. I think this is um, UI here is also called the uh, vSphere client or vSphere web UI. Um, I think this thing's had like multiple names. But um, someone recently had a um, question. And I'll be answering that momentarily on the forum. For now, though, now you guys know what I've been working on for the past few months. And um, I may do, it, um, I guess, a more in-depth tour of the uh, server setup in the future. If you're interested, leave a like, leave a comment, and um, I guess I'll catch up with you guys later. Um, currently no comments, so I guess there's no questions at this time. Peace out.